be in chapter 15 of Mark today as we continue our, our journey through the book of Mark. And I've, I've titled today's teaching, Revolution Complete, this is for two reasons. One, chapter 15 of Mark, which is right toward the end, chapter 16 next week brings us to the conclusion, but chapter 15 is where Mark really kind of brings together everything that he's been laying out from the very beginning. But secondly, there's a revolution that's taking place on the cross that comes to fruition at that point. But I want to start us all the way back at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, where this all began. In the very first words of Mark that, that are penned here, are the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is critical, these two terms, Jesus Christ and the Son of God. Here's why. And I think we've talked about this before a little bit, but the word Christ means anointed one. It, 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 we often hear it translated as Messiah. Those are the same thing, Christ and Messiah, anointed one. But the key to this is that it was a kingly term. Kings became king when they were anointed. They had oil poured upon them. And so to call Jesus the Christ is to call him a king. Secondly, to call him the son of God is to, to give him a divine title. So we have here a, a divine king, the king of the kingdom, the king of heaven. In fact, the very first thing that Jesus teaches when he began his ministry is that the kingdom of God is at hand. So, so we have Mark saying, hey, I'm going to tell you the good news about the king who's come from heaven. And as we've walked through these weeks, that's what's been unfolding. He's been showing us the king. He's been showing us his character. He's been showing us his purpose. And now in chapter 15, a whole bunch of things start to come together. And it all begins with the religious leaders finally hitting their, their limit. They are done with this Jesus, and, and they have arrested him, and they've decided to put on their own trial because they want him out of their lives. And, and in Mark chapter 14, if we back up just a little bit at the end of that chapter, it, it says this, that Jesus was brought before the religious leaders, says, but he remained silent and he made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Notice these are, these are those same terms that, that Mark begins with, right? Now he's being challenged on them. And Jesus said, I am. It was actually a powerful statement because it, 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 he's referencing the, the covenant name of God. He says, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It, and so everything that's now taking place in chapter 15 is built out of this statement, out of this claim that, that, that began at the beginning of Mark, that Jesus truly is the King, the Son of God, that the religious leaders are now using against him. Do you truly call yourself the Christ, the Son of God? And we pick up in Mark chapter 15. I'm going to read the first five verses to us, and then we're going to look at a few other places throughout as we go on. And as soon as it was morning, so this is after the trial where they've accused him, because the, the religious leaders can't actually kill Jesus. So that's the problem they've got. They've got to make an argument that meets the Roman qualification for death. So we pick it up here, and they're now bringing him into the Roman courts. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Pilate was one of the Roman rulers in the region. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? This is a really important statement king of the Jews. We're going to see this over and over again. And he answered him, you have said so. It's a really interesting statement because he's basically like saying, well, is that what you think? He's really kind of nonchalant about it. He's not claiming that he's the king. He's simply saying to Pilate, your words. And, and Pilate holds some serious power. If you go to the other gospels, he, he talks to him, don't you know the power I have? I can have you killed. And there's a little more conversation. But Mark wants to focus in on the notion of the king of the Jews. You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. The, the accusation that they're making and the reason why Pilate had asked him if he is the king of the Jews is, we actually see in Luke, Luke chapter 23, that we get a little more explanation. It says, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. 
Remember there was that, that one account where they asked who he should pay taxes to and Jesus actually catches them in the trap? They're now trying to use that against him. And saying that he himself is Christ, a king. See, the, the religious leaders got this. If your title is Christ, then you are a king. And Pilate asked him the same question, you the king of the Jews, and he answered him, you have said so. We see this, this repetition here. The irony is that the claims that the religious leaders are making against Jesus is that he is trying to overthrow the Roman rule, that, that he's against the Roman leadership, which Jesus clearly isn't. But, but what they expected of a Messiah, of a Christ, was somebody who would overthrow the Romans. That, that's the, the irony of this. They're accusing him of doing the very thing they expect the Christ to do, but he's not doing. In fact, he's not challenging the Romans at all. The people he's challenging are the religious leaders. And that's what's got the, the religious leaders so upset that this, this man who's come to be the Christ, who claims that he's the king, who's supposed to save them, is instead challenging them at every turn and at every step. Barclay, in his commentary, says it this way. Sometimes the Messiah was thought of as a king of David's line, but more often he was thought of as a great superhuman figure crashing into history to remake the world and in the end to vindicate God's people. The Messiah will be the most destructive conqueror in history smashing his enemies into utter extinction. That, that's what the Jews were waiting for. They, they were waiting for this, this king to come in on his horse, a conqueror, a champion, that he was going to free them from the oppression of the Romans, that he was going to establish once again this godly kingdom on earth. It, it, what's really interesting is if you go all the way back to the Old Testament, the Davidic line of kingship that... that the Jews so want reestablished was never even supposed to exist. The only reason that we ever get to Saul, the first king of Israel, is because the Israelites reject God as their king. And, and here we are in this place that they're now expecting the Christ to come, for him to be a physical, political ruler who will reestablish a lineage of kings that didn't serve them well and was never supposed to be there in the first place. And Jesus claims to be the king, and he questions their beliefs. And in response, they want him killed. They want him out of the way because he's not what they want God to be. If he can't come and fulfill their desires, their plan, their understanding, then he's worthless to them. If you flip back a few chapters in Mark, there's a passage we know really well about Peter making a, a proclamation of Jesus being the Christ. we we'll pick it up in, in Mark 8, verse 29. And he asked them, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So here we have what looks like Peter finally understanding, and he gets it right. In fact, in other Gospels, it talks about how the Father has revealed this to him. Peter has seen Jesus for who he really is. And then Jesus begins to actually explain a deeper level of who he is. Look at this next verse. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. So, so here Peter is, and he says, you're the Christ. And what he's really thinking is, Jesus, you're the one who's going to come overthrow the Romans. You're going to reestablish the rule of the Jews. And Jesus says, let me explain to you what I'm really here to do. I'm here to suffer, and I'm here to die. And he makes it as plain as it can be. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. It's, it's pretty ironic, isn't it, that Peter in one statement says, you're the Christ, and in the next moment is saying to the Christ, you don't really know what you're doing. I, I, I kind of catch myself in this place at times. God, your Lord, but let me explain to you how you should be helping me, what you should be doing in my life. And, and, and Peter gets rebuked pretty strongly, right? But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
That's an important term. We're going to look at that a little bit later. I want to read the next couple of verses because it's going to come in as we, as we dig into this. And calling the crowd to him with the disciples. So, right, so Peter has proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ. You are the king. Jesus then explained that the king is going to die. Peter says, no, no, no way. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like man. And then he calls the crowd and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Peter was, was looking at the kingdom of God through human eyes. He thought it was an earthly kingdom. He, he didn't understand it. Jesus knew the misconceptions about who the Christ was to be. And that's why at this moment that, that he makes it so clear who he is, he also makes it very clear that, that his plan is very different than the human plan. When, when the ways of God don't meet our expectations, it's our understanding that needs to change. It's not his methods that need to change. It's not the teachings that need to change. It, and I think all of us have this tendency to want to adjust the truth to fit our reality instead of adjusting our view to fit the truth of who God is. He often does things different than we expect. He often comes in ways that, that, that we wouldn't imagine him to come. He often asks us to do things that we think, what? It, and, and Peter is this great example that we can, we can see God for who he is and still not understand what he's doing and what he's asking us to do. What's, what's really amazing is that this was all made so clear for the believers. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 53, there is a, Isaiah gives this prophecy. He, he's talking about the Messiah, the Christ who's going to come. It says in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In verse 4, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Have you noticed there's nothing here yet that sounds like a conquering king? Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before its shear is a silent, so he opened not his mouth. We just read that. Pilate was astonished that he sat there silently. Verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. In verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. It was all right there. The religious leaders had, had turned it into a political thing. They had turned it into something for their own gain in the immediate. And they missed that God had actually revealed what his son, what his servant would do, what this king would come and do. It, it, it's the, the, the juxtaposition of the king who's supposed to be conquering, and he is conquering, but he's just not conquering the kingdom that they're focused on. He's do, fighting a different fight. You know, I, I think a lot of times we can find ourselves in the same place. Some of the things going on right now have, have just, I think, should open our eyes as believers to what we've believed and where we've stood and the corrections that God is giving us right now. Think about how political we've made church. We, we in a lot of ways, have done the exact same thing. You, you heard Pastor Stephen earlier talking about how we've got to listen to the authorities we want to be together. I miss everybody tremendously. That human interaction, that human touch. Scripture talks about not forsaking the fellowship, but we can fellowship. And we can be the church, and the church hasn't stopped. But we so often set our minds on the things of man. We're fighting for constitutional rights. 
a human flawed document written by men. We, we, we hear a, a political statement that calls the church essential and we celebrate it. But you do realize calling the church essential is not what we want to be known as essential. There, there, nobody has said that this nation will suffer and die if the church is not at the forefront, if the church isn't the foundation. Simply rallying political basis. If essential is us being in four walls, we've missed the entire purpose of the church. And we're not following the example of Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples. Go to the lost. Go to the hurting. The fact that we're not meeting on Sundays may actually give us more opportunity to be the church. The the essential that we should be celebrating is when our country says, without the believers, we're lost. With, without those, who, those little Christ, without the people who love and care, without the people who accept us in our brokenness, we're completely lost and desperate. Remember Jesus, when he talks to Peter, and he corrects them, immediately then teaches them, this is about laying down your life. For others, putting them ahead of us. It's about giving up our rights. Jesus, in Philippians 2, it says he gave up his right as God to come be with us. He took his, the sins, our sins upon himself to die. Paul shows some practical examples in his teachings of what it is to give up our rights and lay down our life. He, he's talking at one point about meat sacrificed to idols. There was a big controversy. The, the, the the idol worshipers would, would sacrifice these, to these idols, false gods, and then they would sell the meat in the meat market. It was cheap, it was good to eat, and some believers would eat it, they'd be like, hey, it's a good bargain, and others wouldn't touch it because it was sacrificed to idols. And Paul actually says, look, this doesn't matter, you can eat that meat. But if me eating that meat will cause anyone else to struggle in their faith, I'll never eat meat again. He gives up what is rightly his to care for others. There's another place where Paul's talking about believers actually, actually suing each other. These are both in 1 Corinthians. He said, you guys are suing each other. You're going to the, the, the court. You're bringing this before the, the, the leaders of the land, and they're looking at you as believers going, really, you guys can't even get along with each other? You need us to settle your own disputes? And Paul says, you, you got to work these things out. And then he says something that's so interesting. He says, why not rather be wrong? In other words, why not have, rather take a loss for the sake of relationship? And over and over again, we see that, that this is what Jesus is doing. In fact, this is what he's doing on the cross, and this is what's so upsetting. And this is what, what Mark is finally bringing us back to. Look at in verse 9, if you go back to chapter 15. He does this again and again and again. Verse 9, I've got him just written down here because so I don't, don't want to miss him. Verse 9, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? There's the second time we've heard king of the Jews. Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they began to salute him, hail, king of the Jews. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Verse 32, let the Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Mark doesn't actually use this term anywhere else. But in, verse, in chapter 15, where he's bringing it back together, where, he's, he's, where he started with Jesus Christ, the King, the Son of God, he's now bringing it back and he's saying, you want to know where he's most king? Where, he, where he's most kingly, where he's showing the power and the strength and the authority of the Son of God? It's on this cross. It's the strength to lay down his life. There's a revolution that's being brought to fulfillment because the prophecies are fulfilled, because the Savior has come, because the King has died for his people. And he's shown us what it is to be a servant. And it upends everything that the Jews have been expecting and everything that they they thought was going to happen. And it leaves them in submission to the Romans. And the world around them in the physical sense, hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's going to get worse. They're now going to get persecuted for following this Jesus. But a revolution starting. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. The king has made a way. The temple curtain has torn. They have access to God like they've never had before. And what really matters, this eternal kingdom, has now been established. They've seen what it is to follow the king, to lay down their lives, to give up their rights, and to love others as God has loved them. I wonder how often, just as we can misunderstand the power of Christ in death, we misunderstand other parts of how God interacts with us in our lives. For example, we call him our provider, right? And, and the church, segments of the church at least have made a mockery of this. Big houses and fancy cars and God's going to give you the best clothes and all of these things. But what if provider isn't so much that we're given everything that we want, but it's that we're sustained with little. That, that's what we actually see in Scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses is talking about the time that the Israelites spent in the wilderness. It says, for 40 years I led you through the wilderness. Yet your clothes and the sandals, uh, yet your clothes and sandals did not wear out. You ate no bread and drank no wine or other alcoholic drink. In other words, you, had, you didn't have this surplus and all of these, these fancy things. Says, but he provided for you so you would know that he is the Lord your God. So their, their clothes remain. And they have food every day, the manna. He's providing for them, not by much, but by sustaining them with just him. In 1 Kings chapter 17, there's a widow who has encountered Elijah and she's She's got nothing left, and he says, make me some bread. And she's like, are you kidding me? I don't even have enough to make it for you. He says, make some for me, and here's what's going to happen. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah had said. And she and, she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. I can't tell you how many times in my life when finances have been tight and the refrigerator's been empty, all of my children have eaten with no more food going in. I, I don't know how it happens, but, but when, when we say God is our provider, sometimes it's the same turning things upside down that we need to understand. It's not that he's going to give me all of my wish list on Amazon, but that he's going to make sure that the things that I have can Continue to carry me forward. He gives us the things that we need. He clothes us. What about healer? So often we don't come to Jesus until we're sick, until something's happened. If you go back to Exodus, God is talking to his people. He says, if you'll listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. Notice what he's saying is, if you live according to my ways, you'll stay healthy. And then look how he, what he calls himself in response to that. For I am the Lord who heals you. As our healer, he keeps our decaying, sinful bodies from the things that should happen. So often, Jesus being our healer is the health that I have and not the sickness leaving. But we get it upside down. Protector. What if it's getting us through the difficult times instead of keeping us from them? Isaiah chapter 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The idea is, is rough waters. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It, I, I, I know that I've been in this place. When things are going difficult, we go, God, where are you? I thought you were supposed to keep these things from me. And instead, what he's doing is holding our hand through them. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They didn't get saved from the furnace. They got joined in the furnace and sustained through the furnace. Just as the religious leaders and the Jews of the day didn't understand who Jesus was, we have to be careful to use his word, to, to lay aside our preconceived notions, 
to really go to his word and understand who he is. The end of, of chapter 15, something amazing takes place, or right toward the end, starting in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Do you see how Mark's brought it complete here? In, in chapter one, this is the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the king, the son of God. Here he is on the cross, the king of the Jews, the king of the Jews, the king of the Jews, the king of the Jews. Hey, all of you religious people, this is your king doing what he always said he was going to do. And then Jesus finally gives his life. There was darkness in the land, the temple curtain tears, and this Roman centurion standing in there with him. This man has crucified dozens if not hundreds of people. He knows what this scene is supposed to look like, and he goes, what I just saw was totally different. That that wasn't a man dying on a cross, that was a man giving his life. How does he know this? Because Jesus is still crying out. When you're on a cross, the way that you die is from suffocation. Eventually, you can't pull yourself up to breathe anymore. But Jesus has a strength. He cries out loudly. And then he gives up his life. He, he died faster than you're supposed to die on a cross. Not only did he not die of suffocation, he offers up his life. Matthew makes that very clear, that he gives his life. In fact, when they go to ask for Jesus' body to bury him, Pilate's surprised. He's like, he's dead already? And he has him go stab him in the side. The, the, the notion of being stabbed in the side in the blood and water that we talk about all the time was they had to confirm he was actually dead. He shouldn't be dead yet. And this centurion who had no preconceived notions about who this man was, he's just using the evidence in front of him, goes, this guy was different. And above his head, the king of the Jews, and he goes, this, this truly was the son of God. This man was everything he claimed to be. For a lot of us who were raised in the church, it is very hard to see Jesus accurately. For many of us in the United States, it's hard to see Jesus accurately because the American church has grabbed onto the American dream instead of the kingdom of God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not in this book. They're in a man-made document that, that we use to try and fight for rights. They are not God-given rights. Even though they say that these are inalienable rights, that is not what God promises us. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He gives us an offer of taking up a cross. He gives us an offer of laying down our life for others. He gives us an offer of loving to the point that, that it hurts. So that we can know an eternal life with him. So that we can bring others with us. When we set religion aside, when we regularly check the word of God against our belief, then we're free to see Jesus for who he truly is. We can, we can get outside of the boxes that we so often live in. And be like this centurion, just seeing him there on the cross. That's the image Mark wants us to have. This is your king, dying in your place. I wonder what we would say if Jesus asked us, who do you say that I am? I think a lot of us would jump, well, you're the savior. But we might be in that same place as Peter and not really understand what we're saying. I want to challenge you, just as Jesus challenged the religious leaders, to go beyond what we think Jesus is, especially in this time. If Christianity was just about meeting together on Sunday mornings, don't you think God would be doing much more to make it happen right now and that it would be safe? But he's totally fine with what's going on. God has not jumped into the scene. In fact, he's just as... Stephen said, he's given us other voices that say, slow down a little bit. And in the slowing down, I wonder how he wants us to see him and, and what he's changing and what he's doing. Will we take him at his word? 
Will we listen to the teaching or will we be like Peter and reject it? Will we only accept him if he's exactly what we want him to be and what we think we need him to be? Or we lay aside all of our notions of who Jesus is supposed to be and allow ourselves to be changed. Allow our our minds to be renewed see him for who he really is and allow him to change us, to love deeper, to to give of ourselves more freely, to truly become essential to our nation. If we're honest, the sad reality is that right now the church is not essential in the United States. My, My hope is that as we see Jesus who he is and we actually become like him, that we'll become essential to our communities, we'll become essential to our families, we'll become essential to our nation. And it won't be about politics, and it won't be about fighting for constitutional rights. It'll be about laying down our lives just like our Savior. So would you just ponder that a little bit today? Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you now? 